Turn your Bibles to John 5.1. Okay, come on, Fred. Come on, bro. Awesome. The title of the message is Pick Up Your Mat Forever. Yeah. Pick Up Your Mat Forever. Come on. And we uh, will read here in verse 1. And uh, before I do that, I want to uh, say a prayer. So please pray with me. Amen. Our God and our Father, I thank you so much for allowing us to come together and hear your word. Father, I pray that you uh, steady my heart. Help me to preach what I prepared that is from you. Help me to do it in a way with the right, exact way an imperfect, flawed man delivers it with the words, the tone, the emotion. Uh, it's your word, God. It's your word. And uh, you chose to use people to, to, to share it and teach it. And God, help us to uh, be humble and really uh, not elaborate or exaggerate or opinionate anything that would uh, corrupt your truth. I beg and pray that I can speak in a way that is approved by you and speak in a way that you allow faith to move people in a divine way. God, thank you for this time. I thank you so much. I'm only an unworthy servant, and we are all unworthy servants. So amazingly grateful to be looked at as worthy to serve you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so in verse 1, it says here, sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now, there in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate, a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethsaida, which is surrounded by five colored, I mean, five covered colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie. The blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jewish leaders said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath law and it forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, the man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick up and walk? The man who was healed and had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning, or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who made him well. And you know, you always got to understand when you understand Christ and what he came to do is die for us on the cross. But before he did that, he showed us what we're supposed to look like after we allow the power of the message of the cross to impact us, to become disciples, and live a life that will be transformed because of the dying of the cross. And that's why he came for three years before. I mean, he was, he was 33, but three years he walked as a human being and really laid it out as a human being and showed us many things before he died. Because he said, the way I'm acting and behaving Besides having your sins forgiven and being saved, you're going to stay alive until I take you. Saved people living on earth, imperfect and still challenged with sin and whatnot. But I'm showing you how, you, what, how you're going to be able to behave with human beings and grow and be like me as a human being with my power and the incredible, miraculous, divine miracle of my death and resurrection that's going to impact you so powerfully you're going to change your life, repent, you're going to be baptized, your sins are forgiven, and I am going to indwell in the Holy Spirit 
and make my home and walk with you and guide you and be with you. That's incredible. So we see here that Jesus as a human being, one of the things I just want to give a side note is, in verse 6, he's walking as a human being. He had to be interested and concerned about people. As a disciple, the greatest commandment is love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second greatest commandment is love your neighbor as yourself. If you don't open your mouth and initiate and, 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 and engage with other human homo sapiens, you know what that is called, students? What's a homo sapien? Don't, human being, how you doing? Just trying to keep you on your feet. You're beautiful homo sapiens. It's beautiful human beings. They teach you that in UCF, Zena? <laughs> See, stick with me, you'll make it. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Look what he says in verse 6. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he engaged with them. He had to learn about the person's struggle. He had to hear from someone else as a human being. Even though he was God and we say he knows everything, he became a human being every way. So he was walking in the crowd and he learned from who? Somebody conversing. Like, what is wrong with that guy? And he, what, 38 years? You're kidding. So he goes over to the guy. Last night we had an incredible singles campus uh, devotional, did we not? It was awesome. And we just talked about the power of loving one another. And really the theme was encouraging one another. And we talked about wisdom from heaven in chapter 3 of James, which is one of, the, one of the characteristics, the gifts of wisdom that you can pray for. It, 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 one of the greatest things is consideration. Yeah. It talks about, you know, peace-loving, impartial, sincere. But one, but one of those attributes, that it, wisdom from heaven, it says consideration. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. People are very considerate in heaven. That's a good place to be. But he says, I want, you to, I want you to be people like that down here. And this is Jesus. Amen. He was considering this man's issue because he was considering and concerned about other people. So he learned, he had to learn, if you, you have to be interested in someone's, somebody else to learn something about somebody else. Yeah. So he learned, wow, really? He goes, he learned that this man's been in his condition for a long time. And he, then he goes over to the man and says, do you want to get well? So he's trying to be solution-oriented. He looks at a problem not in a negative way. He sees a problem and doesn't get critical. He gets discerning. See, so to, to, to look at something with a critical heart is like, wow, they're messed up. Who did that? Why? Gosh, darn it. And then you walk away and just complain. And go, I can't believe they did this. Versus, wow, there's some problems here. Um, let me figure out how I can come up and initiate in a way that the person isn't threatened or hurt their feelings, but, but contribute myself to help yeah. and maybe offer a possible suggestion on how we could, I mean, I, do you need some help here? I can see it looks like it's overwhelming. Can I help you? See what I'm saying? Come on. So he says, do you want to get well? Then we know the story. He, he says, uh, you know, it's, it's almost like a, uh, instant, you know, it'd be kind of maybe even seem insin insincere if you went up to someone in a wheelchair that was crippled and say, do you want to get well, right? Of course, of course, that most people say yes. I don't know how. And this person said, I can't get into the water. And there was a thing where they said that their angel would stir the water. So there was some kind of a, 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 a legend in one of the verses that actually alludes to that. In, in one of the books here, it, it alludes that there, there was some kind of a, a power, but he couldn't get into the water. Because everybody's getting in front of him and he had all these basically reasons, justifiable, but there were reasons why he couldn't do it. Is there reasons why you can't do certain things? Do you want to get well? What do you want to get well of today? Come on. You, you may not have a physical condition, but you may have an emotional condition. And I think more and more, I really believe our, our mind and our emotions are, are sometimes can be our worst enemies. They, our, our own thoughts about ourselves, and we talked about this a while back uh, when Jesus healed, uh, protected, and stepped in the adulterous woman and told anybody who has, sinned to, who has not sinned to cast the first stone, and they all dropped their stones. And then he looked at the woman, he says, where's your accusers? And he goes, they've all gone. And he, goes, and he, and he helps her up and goes, and neither do I accuse you. 
He goes, go and leave your life of sin. But see, even Jesus is right there with this guilty, adulterous woman who was caught in the act, who was sinful. There was a bunch of learning lessons here, but she was guilty as sin. And Jesus goes, I don't accuse you either. But he does say, go leave your life of sin. Because I'm going to work with you. But then why do we accuse ourselves? Because we need a lot of help. Because if you emotionally and negatively condemn yourself, even if you are, it's true, on certain areas that you need to improve in, or you have emotional challenges at times, or depression, it's true, but to accuse yourself, how does that work out for you? How does that benefit you? How does that help you to just let your head run wild with negative down thinking where you kind of be distant from people and push off people that want to help and, and your own pride pricks up and it just gets worse? How does that working out for you? It doesn't work out well, does it? So do you want to get well? And Jesus says, pick up your mat and walk, right? And the man does it. And in verse 14... He finds the man and says, hey, you're well. Stop sinning or something worse is going to happen to you. That's a powerful promise, not a threat promise. The consequences of sin are destruction. Yeah, come on, bro. He who sows in sin reaps destruction. This man had been lame or paralyzed and suddenly could walk. It was an amazing miracle. And yeah, he should be excited. But he needed an even greater miracle, and sometimes we don't understand that ourselves with God. He needed a greater miracle. We pray for God for our needs, our clothing, our, our jobs, all the stuff that is important. He says, yes, pray to me. I'm going to give it to you. Don't worry. But sometimes we get rescued by our prayers and we get through something humanistically, and we get amazed and grateful, and we should be, but we forget the real main huge miracle that he's trying to get your attention in is that i've come here to help you be freed from the slavery of sin emotional mental and physical behavior that is destroying you and destroying each other so he needed and even even though he was cured of a physical attention ailment he got his attention absolutely got his attention and then he says he need, Jesus grabbed him afterwards and said, I know you're all excited and amen, but you need to understand you need to stop sinning. And what he was trying to help him see that is that you need even a greater miracle uh, to have your sins forgiven. The man was delighted to be physically healed, but he had to turn from his sins and seek God's forgiveness to be spiritually healed. And see, physically we still get too worried about the here and now in our lives. And God, the whole reason, one of the reasons he came and died is for you to not worry. I think Fred shared a, a communion or something a while back. And he says, what does God say about worry? Don't do it. <laughs> I, I, don't, don't. He just makes it very clear. It's like a big warning sign in the Bible. Don't worry. Wow. And... The greatest gift we can ever have is to realize that God can free us from the power of a pattern of sin that takes us down. So let's look at 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, and look into this. Pick up your mat and walk forever. He picked his mat up, but he wasn't going to walk forever physically. But if he stops sinning, he's going to walk, spiritually speaking, for eternity. See, those of us who die, if we die in Christ as a disciple, the way Jesus defines it, the lifestyle of faith, in the pattern and humility of following and continuing to grow, we are living forever when you're saved through Christ. So no matter what comes, challenges, physical issues, you can pray for God to remove those, but if he doesn't, You've already got it made, and you've got to focus on the right thing and not focus on the thing God's not cured. Yeah. Right. And you've got to realize he's letting it be there for a reason. Come on. Not just to have you suffer for no reason. For, uh, 2 Peter 1.16. 
We did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were witnesses, eyewitnesses of His majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to Him from the majestic glory saying, This is my Son whom I love. With Him I'm well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven and we were with Him on the sacred mountain. We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable. And you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in the dark place. Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will. But prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. You know, we see that this section where Jesus talks about this, is he, he, Peter affirms that the Old Testament prophets wrote God's message. And he puts himself and the other apostles in the same category because they also proclaim God's truth, carried along by the Holy Spirit. The Bible is not a collection of fables or human ideas or philosophies about God. Yes. It is God's very words given yes. through people to people. God gives, has given it through people to people, yes. but it's God. That's why if you ever heard, listen to the message, not the messenger, you get focused on the messenger, you get off track. Because yep. us, we're all imperfect. We're trying our best, but we may deliver the message maybe in a way where it doesn't, you don't think it's benefiting you, and then you get so distracted and look at the way the person talked, but go, you should go, is there any truth in what's being said? Yes. Peter emphasized his authority as an eyewitness as well as the God-inspired authority scripture to prepare the way for his harsh words that he was going to write later to false teachers. Yes. And there's a lot of false teachers today. Because this is a very powerful moment where God goes later on, even after I raised from the dead, and I've raised from the dead here, he said it's going to happen. And it's happened now. A lot of false teachers spin the scriptures and exaggerate. And they may even be deceived themselves and brought up because over hundreds of years, people brought up in the churches and they're called to be in the ministry. A lot of cemeteries, I mean seminary, excuse me, <laughs> seminary teaches, teaches people the, the lies. So they get religious and they go in this thing and they're not even walking in the world. They're just going and studying theology. But just having a bunch of theology and biblical knowledge uh, is very important. But by itself, if you don't learn to like Jesus did, interact with people and know how to deliver the scriptures yep. in a loving way and help and be patient with careful instruction, you're just, you're just reciting truth, which is good, but it's not effective. Yep. And then people, people just kind of, they, they can be deceived. Yep. There's a lot of false doctrine taught today. You know, he says here uh, in verse 19, uh, Christ is the morning star. And when he returns, he will shine in his full glory. Until that day, we have the Scripture and the Holy Spirit to illuminate it for us and guide us as we seek the truth. Continue to seek God. That's the first principle to find Him. And it stays that principle the rest of your life. Seeking God with all your heart means love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Yeah. So this amazing message that Peter shares about in this story, and we're going to revisit now, is the is 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 stands on two solid foundations. The voice from God at the transfiguration, Peter re recants, says it. The st and still more significantly, he makes a very powerful statement that Scripture is truth. Scripture is the testimony from God directly. Yeah. So now let's look at Matthew 17, verse 1. You guys with me? Have you, been, have you ever had someone tell you a cleverly invented story? You know, have you ever played that game where you have people stand up and you tell them three things about yourself and one of them is a lie and it's for fun. You try to have people go, which one's the lie? 
If you're really good, you can go. You, you can you can uh, you know mix it with some half truths so that people even think they know you. They go, oh, that might be him. I remember he played football when he's young. But then you say, you know, um, and when I was playing football, a coyote jumped over the fence and they had to stop the game for 10 minutes to get it off the field. And it was amazing. And then we started playing again. And the guy, they go, well, he played football. That must be true. But it wasn't true. You know what I mean? You can tell cleverly invented stories, right? If you, because you, you know, if you're telling a story where people think you know you, you got to kind of keep some truth in it and then throw a little how you doing. And then they go, well, it's probably true. And that's the problem with the scriptures. We got the scriptures, but then if you don't stay in the scriptures and listen to the minister or people or don't study it out yourself, you'll have some truth, but then half truths and lies get a little bit of a dis not true thing gets in there. Come on. And then over centuries, people start believing it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Come on. Come on Matthew 1 7. I mean, 17 9. 17 1. Good night. <laughs> we got you. Point number one is what do they talk about? What did they talk about? Because I was, I've been studying this out, and I go, it was just, I'd like to be there myself. That's just amazing. This is an amazing, amazing moment. And it says here, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, and the brother of, the, John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. We had a little group we called the Sons of Thunder, and he, Nick, Jesus nicknamed James and John the Sons of Thunder because they, they, they were short-tempered when he first had them follow him. And they went into a town and they weren't received very friendly of Jesus. And they came out and said, Lord, do you want us to call lightning down on that town? <laughs> and th basically what that was saying is destroy and destroy everybody in that town, that village. Because they didn't accept Jesus. And Jesus nicknamed them sons of thunder. He didn't condone their behavior, but he still brought them with him. He says, come with me. He goes, no, we're not going to do that. Basically in our day, it would be if we were disciples, we'd say, hey, you want us to go in there with a bunch of RK-15s or four, rk uh, AK-57s and just go in there and just sh sh blow up and shoot up everybody and kill everybody in the village. Let's just be real. That's what they were literally saying. You want us to call lightning down on that village and destroy everybody because they're not accepting you? That's really out there as a Christian. But they were Jesus. They became Jesus' inner circle. So when, they, when he nicknamed them Sons of Thunder, at that time he says, you guys have some really destructive zeal. Thunder, that's what it means. Thunder is, dis, it can be destructive and lightning comes anywhere. <laughs> it, 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 if it's not channeled, it, it can damage. Yes. That's really why he called them sons of thunder. It wasn't a compliment at that time. Wow. He said, you guys have some, and most of us, when we're not saved from our sins and understand the power of sin to pick up our mat forever, we have destructive zeal, which means it takes energy to sin just like it takes energy to love God. So, destructive ways of thinking dysfunctional ways of thinking is destructive zeal just like them you could say that's crazy i mean jesus look at him going yeah that's what i want to do guys i want to just take the lightning and kill all those people that's why i'm here that's why i came down i last i thought i was supposed to save people so but he, but he took him with him and then peter put his foot in his mouth at the beginning you're not doing this lord no 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 no. he kept trying to run the show get in front of him uh, no 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 we're not doing this I mean, literally, he was going, I disagree. He's going, get behind me, Satan. Oh. And eventually, Jesus didn't, 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 didn't he, he taught them, but he kept them in the game. He said, I believe in you. Oh. Yeah, you got some serious issues, and we're going to call you out on them. But I'm going I'm to tone you down, but keep that energy, because once you understand who you're walking with, that destructive zeal is going to turn into constructive zeal for my house. Amen. And that's what he's talking about. So here we go in verse 2. There he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. Just then, there appeared before them Moses and Elijah, talking with Jesus. Peter said to, the, to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them. And a voice from the cloud said, this is my son, whom I love. With him I'm well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground. That's, there's another knee prayer. In Orlando, I'm saying, get on your knees every day. And, 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 and because you, you see in the most amazing situations, all the spiritual, incredible people that we look up to that needed God as much as we do, we're on their knees. And then Jesus, his last prayer before he died, he's on his face. Come on. So they're moved, wow. And they're terrified because they're, they're just in awe of, oh my gosh. 
And then, but Jesus came and touched them, and he said, get up. He said, don't be afraid. How many times you got to be told that? Isn't that awesome? Over 365 different ways, I think the Bible says in different ways, don't be afraid, do not fear. Yeah. I, I'm here. I'm going to be with you always. I mean, he assures us, because we get fear. Yeah. When he looked up, they saw no one but Jesus. So, this is an incredible time, because when I look at this, I was just, you know, studying out this week, and I was going... What were they talking about? It's a great conversation, right? Um, you know, and why was Peter's suggestion to set up camp and have a little camping style? Let's have a little, let's have a little retreat here. He didn't want to leave. He didn't want to leave. The fact that Peter's suggestion occurs when Moses and, and, Moses and Elijah are preparing to depart reveals a desire for him. He, I don't want this to stop. I don't want this to end. I want to prolong this experience of glory. He was in the presence of the glory of heaven. Because Moses and Elijah came back down from the presence of God. They were flawed human beings, but they were amazing men of God. But they came down and standed with Jesus. And Peter and James John got to see it. And he said, let's not stop this. The glory of God was there. And I believe they had the closest feeling of what heaven is like. And he said, let, no, 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 no. let me set up shelters. We'll say, let's just stay. Come on, I'll, I'll build a shelter for each one of you. I'm a good builder. Huh? Right? I mean, he's just fired up. He's not delusional. He's like, let's, I don't want this to stop. This is just amazing. I don't want to go back into real life. Let's just stay here. Aww. Come on, Chris. This means that Peter was focusing on the wrong thing, by the way, because that's not what Jesus wanted. We're not setting up shelters, but you're allowed, I brought you up to see this because you're, you're part of this deal, and I'm, you're going to be carrying the ball for a little while after I go, just like these guys carried the ball before I came. Yeah. And he's going to say, you know, Peter focused on the wrong things. We can do that too. Yeah. The experience of the transfiguration is meant to point forward to the suffering Jesus is about to experience. Why these guys? Why not angels? Because God, Jesus became a man in every way. He was God, but he became a man. He relinquished his godlike uh, powers on purpose to the point where he relied on faith. His faith was so great that he could do miracles. Yeah. But he suffered and was tempted in every way a human being does, which even means he had to pray to keep the will of God to do what he came down to do. And we know in Gethsemane, he was struggling and wrestling to get his heart right to continue through in the suffering. Yeah. So he was focused. Peter was like, let's stay here. This feels really good. Let's just stay here. Yeah. And he goes, no, 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 no. This is meant to strengthen the disciples' faith, to watch these two men that if you look at their lives, they were suffered greatly. In the, name of, in the name of God. And they were pointing prophetically. And this is why Moses and Elijah have been speaking about, the, about his departure, which he was going to accomplish. They were encouraging Jesus. They were encouraging Jesus. And Elijah was taken from the earth by a whirlwind of chariots of fire, a godly, you know, a godly grab of angels, it says chariots of fire, so it's God just taking him from the earth alive. Only one other man did that. Yeah. And Moses, when he died, died with a conversation with God. Wow. And they talked. And you've got to understand here that Elijah and Moses are encouraging Jesus to continue on to Jerusalem and the suffering that's coming, and we did it too. And Peter misses the point and wants to stay on the mountain. God then speaks up to correct Peter's understanding because it was for his benefit. Moses and Elijah already came from heaven and they went back. Yeah. Jesus knew that was going on and he was going, but Jesus still needed encouragement. But Peter needed to hear this to write what we just read in 1st, 2nd Peter. Uh, he speaks up and he says what? This is my son, my chosen one. You will do well to listen to him because you're going to experience things that Jesus, Moses, and Elijah experienced as you become a disciple and live your life. 
Not only what Jesus does, we're going to follow and we're going to somehow attain the resurrection from the dead. Like Paul says, I want to know Christ and somehow attain the resurrection of Jesus. And he says, I want to know him and I want to participate in his sufferings. Paul says, I want to participate in his sufferings and somehow attain the resurrection from the dead. You got, so we see this amazing thing and we understand Elijah had walked with God. His work had been painful and trying for the Lord through him allowed him to rebuke and call people to repent of the sins in Israel. He was a prophet of God, yet he was also had to flee from place to place to save his life. And get this, his own people were hunting him to kill him like a wild beast. When he was telling them what God said, God's people, he was challenging God's people as a leader and his own people that said they want to follow God and the Ten Commandments through Moses. They were the ones that turned on him and said, let's get him. Yeah. That's pretty powerful. Yeah. And God finally said, you know what? You've done a great job. I'm taking you up. Cool, Moses was greater than anyone who ever lived before him. He had been highly honored from God, being privileged to talk with the Lord face to face as a man speaks with a friend. Wow. He was permitted to see the bright light, excellent glory, and shroud of the Father. And through the Lord, Moses delivered the children of Israel from Egyptian bondage. Yeah. Moses was a mediator for his people, often standing between them and the wrath of God. In fact, when God, the anger of the Lord was greatly kindled against Israel and their unbelief, their murmurings and their, their murmurings and their mutterings and their complaining and arguing and their grievous sins, Moses' love for them was tested. God said, I'm destroying them. I'm taking them out. I can't, I'm going to destroy them. Wow. And Moses showed his love for Israel as he, as he earnestly pleaded on their behalf. He prayed to God to turn his first fierce anger to forgive Israel. And he even says this, if you can do that, I'm willing to have my name blotted out of your book. Wow. Those are credible human yeah. beings. That, that, those are human beings. They, that, that's how selfish they became about God's glory. They, their love was so close to Christ that they were willing to go to hell, which wasn't correct thinking because God's not going to do that, but they were willing to go whatever it takes for these people. They got to a place where many of us dream of. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Talk about it. So what were they talking about? Well, first of all, they, it shows from heaven they have relationships. They have relationships. God showed that Moses and Elijah came down and talked with Jesus as people, even though it was a miraculous showing, they were talking. Yeah. They were talking. Yeah. They were close. They were encouraging each other. You can do this, man. I don't know if they said you can do this, man. But they, they were saying this is the time. This is what's happening. You're the final plan of God. You are now bringing into the new covenant and you, you are going to die and, 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 and the law is going to be crucified as well. Yeah. It's been fulfilled. This is it, man. All the stuff that God allowed us to do, this is you. We've been talking about you in the Old Testament. We're all in this together now. Yeah. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. And, and it shows that relationships are very powerful even in this situation. They're talking with each other and they're encouraging each other and they're encouraging Jesus that to keep going to Jerusalem. This is what's to happen. Amen. And, and God sent those two down to encourage Jesus and let Peter see these are two flawed dudes yeah. that did such great things. And I'm a flawed dude. And I'm up here. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I can do things like them if I continue to say, listen, and really believe. Like God said, listen to him. Yes. See, he's saying the same thing to you. This is my son whom I'm well pleased with. You, you will do well to listen to him. Yes. And if you listen to him, you can do greater things than Elijah and Moses if he wants you to. Wow. But it's not for your glory, it's for his. Amen. Isn't that amazing? Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. So what were they talking about? They were talking about perseverance. They were talking about it's worth it. 
We are talking about it's God's plan, and yeah, we're suffering, and you know what? It's an honor to suffer. And you know what Moses and Elijah got to do at that point? They got to comfort Jesus from their comfort they finally received when they went into heaven. They were up there comforted. It was done. Their work was done. And they came down and said, I'm going to comfort you now. Amen. And that's, now we're going to see how this transforms us. Look at this verse here in 2 Corinthians 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God in Corinth, together with all his holy people throughout Acacia, grace and peace be to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. So Elijah and Moses received comfort. Believe me, if you already died and you're in the presence of God, and God says, hey, can you go down and talk to that Bob Armstrong? He's feeling a little discouraged, and I just want you to... Show up in his woodshed while he's throwing, while he's out there working on those, that 3,000 volt shed that he put together for those hurricanes. Just pop on down there and say, bro, it's going to be all right. Come on, Bob. Yeah, come on. You know what I'm saying? But these guys were comforted. See, if I'm in heaven and I get to go down, I'm fired up because I've already lived my life. I've, like Paul said, I fought the good fight. I kept the faith. I finished the race, man. And now, right before I go to heaven, I get marched out with one less little act, and they're going to cut my head off. <laughs> That's what happened after he said that. He goes, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I kept the faith. Now it's in store to me. And then right after that, shortly, he was in prison when he wrote that. He was marched out, and they cut his head off. Yeah. So he was already fired up, but then he had to finish the human thing. And his head went boom, boom. And then he realized, it doesn't matter. I'm going. Amen. So the last suffering was in the name of was for us. He, this was written for us. So now we are being comforted by his sacrifice and faith in spite of knowing what was going to happen. We go, how could he do that? Because he understands what he's receiving. And see, Moses and Elijah came down to comfort Jesus. They suffered and they came down just like we could do. It says, look in verse 5 again, for just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patience, endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope for you is firm because we know that just as you share in our suffering, so also you will share in our comfort. Yeah. Wow, so your suffering is all worth it. It's in a huge plan. And the Bible says somewhere else, don't suffer for being a criminal. That's not working for you. Yeah. But if you suffer in the name of Christ, it's a good thing. Yeah. Don't suffer if you go and do bad choices and sin. On, that, that's, that's kind of a, you're going to get a redo because God's going, okay, you're still alive. If you want to repent and come to me, we're going to forgive you. Right. Yeah. Uh, the consequences may linger with you, and that's going to be the pain and suffering you're going to learn to overcome. But, uh, but we'll, we'll get back on the track. Let's hit the reset button. That's right. But that suffering doesn't count toward what I'm talking about here. But you suffer as a Christian, that's good. That's right. Come on, brother. It says here, in verse 8, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experience in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure. So we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. But this happened. See, this happened. He had to go through it to be able to write this. See, you can't tell your story until you go through the real challenging time. In the challenging times, it's not the time you're going to be able to even probably talk correctly. It's probably not a time to tell your story. You'll probably tell it with bitterness and anger and blame shifting. But if you stay in the game, you're going to work all through that and realize God is a judge. I'm not. I'm going to focus on you. What do I need to learn? And when you get through it, you're going to come out of it, and then you can tell a story. But until you suffer in the name of God and do it correctly, you got nothing to give. you got to suffer, come out faithful, Amen. maybe losing a limb or two and barely alive, but you still gave glory to God. You come back, if it gets that bad, you just go, 
Let me tell you a story yeah. about a guy like me. Let's go back and tell it. It's really, I don't want to go back. Wouldn't want to do it again, but I made it and God taught me a lot. That's right. Right? That's right? So it says here in verse, he says in verse 19, indeed we felt we've received the sentence of death. I mean, just take me, man. Just, I don't want, I just, if I can go without sinning against you and everybody can be all right around me, just, just take me. Get me out of here. I don't want to live. That's not a correct human way. God gives life, God takes it. You're not the one to say, this is what I signed up for, I want to go. No, you might feel like you want to go and there's hopelessness, but God said, no, that's not your role. You've just stepped on the wrong side of the street. That's not your side of the street. Your side of the street is to endure and trust in me. My side of the street is I'll take your life when it's time. I gave you life and I take life. You have, it's not even in your business section. You have nothing to do with it. So even contemplate anything like that is totally out of bounds. You will be born when I told you as a man or a woman, and you will be born what race I put you in, and you will be born what country and what century, and exactly you had nothing to do with it. You didn't come out and go, I planned this. You didn't even get to plan your name. They named you. Now, maybe some of you were rebellious and changed your name when you came older and said, I'm going to call my name Freddie. I don't like Mark. I'm going to be Freddie. But, and I'm going to even add fast Freddie because I'm just going to do that. So you had no, no control coming in. Really, did you? No. And if you're really honest right now, everything has happened to you, even though you had some plans, nothing's really worked out exactly as you planned. Yeah. Things come up even when you're trying to plan it. <laughs> so just get used to realizing you're really not in control. <laughs> so don't try to decide whether I'm going to die now because it's terrible. No, get some help. Talk to somebody. That's right. But understand, it's not your business to understand whether you're supposed to go or not. Now, I've had feelings of great despair at times. And wanted it to pass very quickly, and it went along, and it didn't pass as quick as I wanted. Yeah. All I knew that I could do then is when I had nowhere else to go for comfort, it was on my knees. Even people that were godly trying to comfort me, it wasn't enough. And I realized they were doing well, but I realized I had it off bounds. It was like Peter going, "Hey, this is good. I feel good with you guys around me. I feel good." No, that, it's good to get encouraged, but I still had to learn it's not fulfilling fully. I got to be on my knees by myself because I realized the only thing that can get me through this really bad pain right now is God. But you only learn that when you suffer. Come on. Then you look at here. We are despaired of life, verse 9, received sense of death, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God, who, ra who, who, who raises the dead. Wow. So he said the intense challenges that you think you don't deserve or why is this happening is happening ultimately so you can understand how to rely on God in a way that you don't understand he wants you to yet. And it doesn't mean that you go, I am Ryan. No, no. And don't start going, I pray five days a week. And I do that. Don't, that's not about it. Reading and praying is the first start. But you got to understand, don't start justifying yourself. Go to God, read, pray, be, pray for humility, pray to hear his voice, and pray to be open and humble to people around you and listen to him. Yes. And then with pray... And then, then you might start to understand God's trying to get your attention. Amen. Sometimes people are really close to you are telling you things that you need to hear. You go, hey man, hey man, I'll pray about it. I'm going to read my Bible now. No, no, you read your Bible, but what just was told you was very powerful from God. I mean, it's like God's going like this. Oh, really? Okay, amen. I know you know me really well. I appreciate you saying that. And the guy's saying it where I don't want to hurt you. I don't mean this in a wrong way. I've been there before. But I got to tell you, bro, you don't listen and you're very stubborn and you're prideful and you don't listen to really anybody. But you always go, I'm going to read my Bible and you, you underline the scriptures and you point scriptures out. But you're not very good at listening in between the lines as a human being because you are putting people off and, and, and hurting people and you don't even see it. But you're quick to show scripture. No, no, you're hurting people. You need to be humble. So don't go back to the Bible now. Read and pray, but just try to listen to what I said. Yeah. Okay, now we need to go to the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> So see, sometimes we dismiss the people, people bringing people God's word. That's how he works. People bring people messages off the word of God. Amen? So we see this, uh, Jesus was strengthened. So isn't that awesome? Now let's go to Isaiah 1. So what are you suffering from today? 
Pick a number. I think if we wanted to make a menu, we could have a like, five-page menu. We could go to one of those, uh, what are some of those big restaurants here that have five pages of menus? I know back in uh, Jump, Claim Jumper, they don't have Claim Jumper here, do they? In California, they have Claim Jumper. Man, it's such a big menu. I'm so bad at making decisions. I mean, I eat like three things, period. Right now, I'm on a real big kick where I'll eat oatmeal with peanut butter and honey two or three times. I could live on that. I go, I could be in prison. That's about a $2 meal. I'd rather have that than filet mignon or lobster. I'm just, I'm not addicted, but I'm really fired up. I don't know why. I get on these things, don't I? And then I'll go, th then I'll start eating something else and I'll be, you know, I try to still eat my kale. I'm getting back into that and my onions. I can eat my, but I'm just a pretty simple dude. I mean that in facts. And I don't mean that. I just mean, it's, I'm pretty, I don't know. Am I pretty easily maintained? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but I get fixated on certain things that people go, what in the world are you thinking? I don't know. I just like it. I can't wait. I dream about it. I'm just <laughs> Anytime someone says peanut butter or honey in a TV show or someone brings up honey, I'll hear Cassidy and Sonia kind of giggle in the other room. Because <laughs> they know dad and husband is the peanut butter fiend. And, 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 but it says, in, in Isaiah 1.18, it says here. Now let's look at this, guys. See, we often depend on our own skills and abilities when life seems easy, and we only turn to God when we feel unable to help ourselves. But as we realize our own powerlessness without Him and our need for His constant help in our lives, we come to depend on Him more and more. God is the source of power, and we receive help from Him by keeping in touch with Him consistently, not just when things are going wrong. Uh, this, uh, with this attitude of dependence, problems will drive you to God rather than away from Him. See, until you start to mature, problems will drive you at times away from Him to sin. Even as disciples, you'll run to sin because His timing's not quick enough for you. But you don't want to suffer, that's the problem. You're not really getting tougher, and you got to get tougher as a Christian. What I mean tougher is you got to be able to endure the pain and suffering that God causes or allows, even if it's unjust from some other person, God allowed it. Yeah. And then you got to go, it's painful. You can cry and talk to people. Don't be macho, but, but don't get mad. Yeah. Go, there's a reason. Yeah. And if i got to be on my knees, and you, you won't even think, well, i, I got to do my prayer time today. No, you'll just be dropping. Yeah. You'll be dropping in public restaurants and don't even worry if the floor is dirty. You'll just be dropping consistently because you're hurting so bad, going, God, I need you. God, I need you. Now, now we got a good walk with God. On, and and, and uh, in Isaiah 1, 18, it says, come now. And I love how God speaks with us, don't you? Come on now, guys, come on. Let's settle this matter. You little prideful nightmares, I love you so much. <laughs> I, I'm including me in that because I'm one. Of, but, but, but that's what he's going to Come on, guys, let's settle this matter, says the Lord. Though, though your sins are like scarlet, which means... It's so stained, nothing can take it out. Like if you're looking at clothes, you cannot take it out. I don't care if you send it to the NASA washing machines. They can't get it out. It's never going to be fixed. It's always going to be stained. That's what he's saying. Our souls and our life is with sin. He says, even though your sins are like scarlet. Now you need to humble out and realize your sin is as bad as the other person's sins. See, sometimes we're like that. It's like, I'm, not the, I'm like, the, like them. You know, no, 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 no. You just look at you. Your sin, no matter what it is, if it's a sin and you know it's a sin, it's scarlet. And, but they will be as white as snow. They are as red as crimson. Once again, he deepens the word crimson. Crimson is a, is a, is a really uh, uh, a rich, deep red color, like purple. It's so deep you can't, he's like making it clear, if, you put, if that stains on your clothes, it's, it's just, I don't care what you do, you're, it's never going to be fixed. That's what he's saying, how bad sin is. And he says, they're going to be like wall. And he says, but then he, then he says, I'm reasoning with you guys. Don't deserve it. You're guilty. Yes, you've done it all. Just get humble and realize it. I'm not trying to put down you. I'm just trying to let you see you are not saved. You are in sin and you can't do it by yourself. Yeah. And that's why I created you. Just be humble and go, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. And then he says, if, conditional, if, if is a very powerful word. It's two syllables. Is that a syllable? Two, two letters. Two letters. If, 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 if is so powerful. If is like one of the most powerful words in the vocabulary. It so can change gears. If, wow, if, 
That's a total condition now. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. But if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Now, this is written in comparison, but sometimes you go, well, no one's broken the door and with a bunch of swords starts stabbing me. No, it's poetic. It's talking about your life's going to be devoured. It's like if you are willing and obedient. Think about it. He doesn't go if you are obedient. That wouldn't be enough. See, obedient alone can actually be wrong because it can be, it can almost be like compliant. But you're, you're smiling on the outside, but inside you're still doing what you're told, but you're not fired up about it. You're actually grumbling and doing it either because you, it's your boss and you hate your job, but you, you know, you need it. And you know, you can look for another job, but you got to keep that job, right? And suffer in it until you get another job. That's character. You don't just go, I just had it. I quit. Oh, really? You got something else going? No, I'll find something. Yeah. We'll see how that works. Don't touch my chicky chicken noodle soup in the counter either. Because you don't have a job. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Keep your job till you get another job. It's a very yeah. fundamental teaching. If you're willing and obedient, willing has to be your part. Yes. Don't obey until you get your heart, and that's where you got to suffer and fight and pray and wrestle if you want to please God to get your heart willing to do things, kind of like what Nick said, God loves a cheerful giver. He calls us to give our pledge and our vow. We have missions coming up for the members of the church, and we know we continue to support the work and the plantings, and the Orlando group is going after it, and, and so is Tampa and all the churches. We all have our, our goals, but you got to go, why would I do that? I've already got my salvation. I'm comfortable. Well, now you're doing it for others' comfort. You're giving and suffering and sacrificing so the missionaries that have went and told that we're not going to leave you and abandon you in another country, holding up the church there and teaching foreign people that you became their own, we're not going to say sorry. They all got comfort. They all they got their salvation and they got their good little thing going in their little church over in America. They're not helping anymore. Wow, that's a wrong heart. Once you get comfort, you're willing to suffer so we can comfort others to be saved. You guys got that? That's, that's what it is. We're going on in suffering because God will still comfort you, but it's a great act of service to give and make disciples of all nations and also support the local church with the weekly contribution. And we got this beautiful building. Thank the members they raised. I pray that the members of Orlando take it serious as an act of worship toward God and keep your vow because it is a faithful sustaining of what we're doing. And I want this 170 room full of baptized disciples where we have to start another afternoon service and raise up leaders here or get another building. We don't stop until there's 15 plus thousand or we die. And I'm just saying that because that might be a few, but I, I don't stop. Keep going, keep going, keep going. But it takes each person to suffer and raise up. So, um, it, so if you're willing, are you willing before you're obedient when it's God's commands? Are you willing to do the work of the Lord? Are you willing and do you stop and have a conversation with God and then an honest conversation with the Bible and then an honest conversation on your knees that I don't feel like it, I'm mad, I'm resentful, and you, and you get it all out with them. Talk to them, go give me help, and then get it out with the brother or sister in your life. And go, I know it's wrong. And, get your, and, go, and pretty soon your heart will be willing and then you do the bit obedience. See, the willing's all the work inside before you step one step. Oh, I'm not willing. Now I am willing. I'm willing. Thank you, God. When you're willing, you're fired up to run through doors into fire to get people out. You'll go into fires. You'll be like a fireman running into a building building because it's not about you. It's about saving others. See what I'm saying? And it says here, you're going to eat the good things of the land. So guess what? You're willing and obedient. It's not like it's, you're, going to, you're going to just be thrown out. No, it says you get, you get good stuff. <laughs> I'm like, I got you. How you doing? And then he says in verse 20, if you resist and rebel. Now listen to resistant. That could be stubbornness, contempt, outward rebelliousness toward authority, or inner quiet reservations, on, or not, be, not willing to be a disciple or not willing to be involved in leadership decisions of what God is saying to do as a church to continue to do God's will. It's just all got to be perfect for you. You're not willing to change relationships or move here or do whatever. No one has to do anything they don't want to. But Jesus said, deny yourself, carry your cross daily and follow me. That doesn't mean 
that you're just going to be comfortably doing it. You know what? Being a disciple is not necessarily a comfortable life, but it's an awesome life. And comfort's not all it's wrapped up to be. Just think if you didn't need to do anything ever again and you just lay, just no alarm clock, just slept in as late as you want, wandered to the kitchen, fed your face, went back and laid on the couch and ding, ding, and just had nothing to do. Like you'd be so sick of comfort by the end of the night, you'd be struggling. You'd be the most angry, upset person. People would call you and the people that are working hard at the job, you'd just be going, oh, no, I'm not doing that real. What are you doing? I'm just laying around. I got nothing to do. Oh, wow. And you're struggling. Okay, amen. So comfort's a blessing, but, but it's meant to be blessed by doing the work of the Lord. And then when you do have that rest, it's awesome. Amen. If you resist and rebel, that means if you're stubborn against God's word, if you're not quick to repent, if you're not quick to be humble, get quick. You got to get good at being quick. That's right. You, you got to work on that. Someone once said, I'm not really good at changes. The brother said to him, I need you to start praying to get good at changes. I'm not really good with discipleship changes. I, I'm... I'm well, I need you to get really good at that. Now, I need to start praying to get good at changing and being willing to be used wherever you need. Right. You can't just cling on to your little friend. That's great. You got one friend. That's always going to be there. Now, go make another friend. Amen. Do what was done for you. Yeah. And that's what Jesus was doing with Elijah and, and, and Moses. Moses and Elijah said, wow, you know, they're honoring you. But listen, you can do this, man. Jerusalem. Goal line is Jerusalem. Goal line is Jerusalem. Come on. You're on the 50. You're on the 60 or 50. I mean, the 40 or 30 yard line, the end zone is close. Yes. You've taught these guys, Peter and James and John, those nitwits, man, they were so destructive at first. Look what you've done with them. They've totally now are just in awe. Look at Peter. He still looks like he's blind. He's like, he, I mean, and they went kind of like, Peter doesn't really get it yet, but I know he comes around because he was, you know, he put his foot in his, we've been watching. He's been putting his foot in his mouth a lot, but you, you hang in there. You're patient with him, but I see Peter changing. Amen. He's going to throw another nightmare in your kink when it gets really intense, but he is going to come back around again. So hang on. <laughs> He's worth it. He's worth paying for. He's worth That's living right. for. He's Come worth on. doing. But you know what I mean? And Peter's like, let me build shelters. Let's, like, let's stay here. And they're like, just stay down there. Wait a okay. You can do this. You can do this. And then they go back down. See what Come I'm saying? But, but, but Peter kept him with him. He goes, like, right now, you're, you're, you're not very helpful, but you're going to be because I believe in you. Amen? Yeah. So if you're resistant about, you'll be devoured by the sword. Did you guys understand what I just said? Yeah. Uh, I was winded. All right, so, so closing out, let's go to uh, Mark 8, 34. <laughs> I'm out of breath. <laughs> Last scripture. Oh, my God. <laughs> All right. All right. Mark 8, 34. Then a crowd called, then, then Jesus called the crowd to him along with the disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anybody give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and the glory of the holy angels. There we go. Jesus was denying himself. Moses denied himself. Elijah denied themselves. Because what could they give in exchange for their soul and what could they give in their, what would we get not living for God's will? Yeah. They suffered, but the glory far outweighed the suffering and it benefited millions, yeah. even possibly billions. Because the Bible's written out and we have it all time for us to carry the message as disciples. We need to carry the message and when we suffer, we'll get the comfort after the suffering. And then that was done so we can comfort others who are suffering. And that's how we relate and connect to other people who need help emotionally. And, 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 and from the sins that they're slave to, we can say, it hurts. Yeah. And I can get you out of this because I can share a story. And I understand suffering not only before as a Christian, I caused it. But even as a Christian, you're going to understand suffering for God is amazing. Yes. 
Because you get comfort and then you learn how to comfort others. You can't comfort someone if you can't identify with the pain, right? So that's the issue. So um, pick up your mat and walk forever. What were they talking about? They were talking about future glory, big picture. That's what they're talking about. And we need to do the same. And to God be the glory. Amen. Amen.